तो कुछ हम टीचर्स के एक्सपीरियंसेस देखते हैं ये वीडियोस देख के जब आप ये वीडियोस देखेंगे तो आपको पता चलेगा कि कैसे टीचर्स ने जिंदगी लोगों की चेंज की एंड एज आई पुल्ड आउट माय जर्नल इन इन माय जर्नल बॉक्स आई सॉ दीस टू लेटर्स एंड आई कुडंट फिगर आउट व्हाट दे वर बट व्हेन आई फाउंड देम आई वाज ब्लोन अवे एट व्हाट दे वर दे वर टू लेटर्स दैट हैड बीन रिटन टू मी बाय टू ऑफ माय टीचर्स माय सीनियर ईयर एट केडी हाई स्कूल एंड दिस इज पार्ट ऑफ व्हाट वन ऑफ दोस लेटर्स सेड You're extremely talented and intelligent, but most importantly, you have a good heart. I know you will use your talents to help your fellow man, and that's the most satisfying life a person can have. And it was signed by my English teacher, Joella Exley. It said some other things, but that's what jumped out. Put it away. I pulled out the second letter, and this is part of what that letter said. Don't quit writing, especially in your journal. Someday it may be the basis for your book. You have insight, sensitivity, intelligence, and maturity beyond your tender years. Keep being you. You're a special person. and it was signed by my creative writing teacher Polly McRoberts and those words absolutely haunted me they just haunted me because i said wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute i know who i am i know who i am i'm loose signs i'm a 19 year old version of that 6th grade kid that's never going to make it through a single day whose job it is to make your life hell who's never going to learn i'm using drugs i'm depressed out of my mind i'm working as a dishwasher i have no future i know who i am but here were these two women for whom i had tremendous respect that were disagreeing with me and because of who they were and the kind of life they lived in front of us in the classroom i couldn't just blow them off i couldn't just say well you don't know what you're talking about and because of their character and their integrity i knew they would not have written these words to me if they didn't absolutely believe it so back and forth i went back and forth who's right about me who's right about me so finally i said you know what i need to put this theory to the test i need to figure out who i am I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to sign up for a college course. I had no idea how to do that. Neither of my parents went to college, but I went to the University of Texas at San Antonio. I was accepted. The first course I had to take was Introduction to English, and I said, "Oh, thank God, because if I have any hope of passing a college course, it's got to be this English course." Well, at the end of the semester, I remember I got my grade and I passed it. Couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. And so I started thinking, you know what? Maybe Mrs. Roberts and Mrs. Exley were right about me. Maybe they could see something in me that I couldn't see in myself. On the one hand, on the other hand, maybe this was just a clerical error for all I know. Should probably take another course. So I took another course that spring and I passed it, couldn't believe it. And then I took a course that summer, then two, then three, and it just kept going a little at a time. And then just before I turned 27 years old, I graduated with my undergraduate degree in English. Never, never, never thought I was going to co- get a college degree. I never did. But there I had it. And then I started thinking, you know what? They were right about me. Mrs. McRoberts and Mrs. Exley could see something in me that I couldn't see in myself. And I said, you know what? I'm done being Lou. I'm done being that kid that's never going to make it through a single day, whose job it is to make your life hell, who's never going to learn. And then just psychologically as a way to give myself permission to be somebody else, I said, I'm going to start going by my first name now. I'm going to be Adam. And maybe Adam can live into this life that those two teachers saw in him so many years ago. Well, I started my master's program and then I started my own therapy to work through my own past, my own trauma and my own abuse. Finished my master's and then I applied for a PhD in school psychology at Texas A&M. And then the whole thing came full circle. And uh it was March of 2001. I remember I was sitting in Logan Airport. I was finishing my internship at Boston Children's Hospital under a fellowship appointment to Harvard. And I was scheduled to graduate in May and I had applied for postdocs at Brown, Yale and Columbia and Brown was my top choice. So I'm sitting in the airport at Logan waiting for my flight. I was going to fly back to College Station to defend my dissertation, and my cell phone rang. I said, "Hello, this is Adam." And then a voice on the other end of the phone said, "Adam, hey, this is Dr. Jay Reeb at Brown Medical School. Listen, we got your paperwork. We we really enjoyed our interview with you, and I'm calling to offer you a fellowship appointment here at the medical school." And I was just thrilled. I mean, this was my top choice, right? So as he's talking about the research and the clinical work, um I had an incoming phone call and I didn't recognize the number. And I said, I said, Dr. Rio, I said I'm so sorry to ask, but do you mind if I put you on hold? I have a call coming in. I think I need to take it. No problem. Click over. Hello, this is Adam. Then a voice on the other end said, Adam, hey, this is Dr. Chuck Sanislow at Yale Medical School. Listen, we got your paperwork. We really enjoyed our interview with you. <laughs> and I'm calling to offer you a fellowship appointment to to Yale. I said, dude, I got Brown on the other line. I'm going to have to call you back. <laughs> Click. Took the position at Brown, hung up, and then it hit me. In that moment it hit me and I realized, Adam, You can write your own ticket. You are qualified to do what you love to do, which is practice psychology at any hospital, any university, any uh, school district in the country, and you're bilingual. 
And I realized in that moment I wouldn't have those options if I didn't have a PhD in psychology. And I never would have had the courage to apply for a PhD if I hadn't finished my master's degree. And I never could have applied for a master's degree if I hadn't first finished my undergraduate degree. And you know what? I know that I know that I know that I know that I never would have stepped out for that first degree had educators not spoken truth into my life about who I am and my identity. And I'll tell you right now, I will be forever grateful to Mrs. McRoberts and Mrs. Exley for the moment of impact they had in my life. If you ever happen to be in Katy, Texas, by the way, and you're driving down Westheimer Parkway, you're going to see that building, and that's Joella Exley Elementary. And if you ever happen to be driving down Franz Road, you're going to see that building, and that's Polly McRoberts Elementary. And I am so proud of Katy ISD for honoring these two women. Now, let's go to my second uh, case study. This was Lauren Garcia, and when I look at that picture of Lauren, her smile doesn't convince me. Um, and when I think about who she was at this time, I think, what does she have to smile about? She had been in protective uh, services, the custody of protective services, for two years already in her young life. She had experienced things that no human being should ever have to experience, let alone a little girl. And then we sit her down in front of a camera and tell her to say cheese. Well, what's there to smile about? Well, what happens with children that are in, in protective services in custody when they're 10, 11, 12 years old, if they haven't been adopted by that time, statistically speaking, the likelihood that they will ever be adopted, it drops dramatically. Well, what happened with Lauren was she ended up in court, but with her, the circumstances were a little bit different. It wasn't juvenile court, it was an adoption court because a family read her file and they said, we know exactly what we're signing up for. And in March of 2010, Lauren Garcia became Lauren Signs and that was the day that my wife and I adopted her. And there we are on our adoption day with my biological children and that was a very, very special day in our family. That was on a Tuesday. That very next Saturday, Lauren and I had our very first daddy-daughter dance. And there we are getting ready for the daddy-daughter dance. And she was so cute. I remember I said, all right, sweet girl, you've got new shoes. You've got a new dress. You're beautiful. I said, you know what? Before the dance, I'm going to take you out to dinner anywhere you want to go. And man, her little eyes just lit up. She said, are you kidding me? Anywhere I want to go? I said, anywhere you want to go. I don't care. You name it. Steak, seafood, Chick-fil-A. So there we were at Chick-fil-A in our formal wear, waffle fries and chicken sandwiches. It was the bomb. So after dinner, you know, we ended up at the dance. And we were still getting to know each other at that point. She'd only been with us for about uh, six months. And I remember at the dance, I just wanted to make one point of connection with her, you know. And so when we got there and we settled in, I remember I reached over and I held her hand and I took this little picture. And I said, sweet girl, there are two things you need to understand about being my girl and about being family. I said, the first is this, you do not make the rules in our family. Mom and I make the rules, and your job is to follow them. There's not a question mark at the end of that statement. There's not a comma at the end of that statement. There is a period at the end of that statement. Do you understand me? And she said, yes, sir, I do. And I said, very good. Here's the second thing you need to know. I said, do you know what my job is? And she said, yes, sir, your job is to make sure that I follow the rules. And I smiled at her, and I said, oh, no, 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 sweet girl. I said, listen to me. My job is to lay my life down for you. My job is to protect you. My job is to provide for you. My job is to guide you. I said, sweetheart, you don't understand this about yourself yet, but you are the most precious thing on the planet. There is no pile of money anywhere on the planet more valuable than you, not even in the same category. And, and my job is to lay my life down for you so that you will understand your value. Because when you understand your value, you will live as though your choices matter. You will understand that just like me, you have a calling, you have a purpose, you have a destiny, you are on this planet for a reason. And then in a moment of incredible insight, she looked at me and she said, Dad, I don't think I've ever been loved that way before. And I remember I smiled at her and I said, oh, sweet girl, sweet girl, believe it or not, I know exactly how you feel. I said, let me tell you a story about a kid I used to know. His name was Lou. <laughs> and I shared my story with her. And it was a powerful, powerful moment in our relationship. 
And the reason I share my daughter as, as a case study is just to underscore the generational power that educators have in the classroom. When, when we as educators make that connection with those students, we change every heartbeat they have to the grave. And when I think about the men and women that poured into my life, the educators like Mrs. McRoberts and Mrs. Exley, that poured into my life when quite frankly, I was not the best version of myself. How do I look at a little girl like this and not bring her into my life? That is the power of an educator. That is the power of a teacher. So let me conclude with this. I'm going to answer that question that my mom asked me when I was in juvenile sitting in handcuffs. What are you doing here? What am I doing here? You know what? By God's grace, I know who I am today. My name is Dr. Adam Lewis Sines, and I'm here on this stage today because my life was impacted by the power of a teacher. Thank you. Forty-five minutes. That's the amount of time it can take to change somebody's life forever. It happened to me. I'm going to take you back to Maryland and me as a seven-year-old. I grew up in Perry Hall, Maryland, and I'm sitting on a carpet square on this particular Tuesday morning in elementary school, and I was on the edge of the carpet square. And my friends and I were all on the edge because there was a guy who was coming to visit our school on this particular day who was known as Ranger Bill. Ranger Bill worked for the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, and Ranger Bill was an environmental educator. And he brought with him that day a turtle and a snake and an owl and a hawk and a vulture. And he came in, and this guy was looking snazzy. He had this great-looking uniform on, all these animals, and he edutained us. It wasn't just teaching he was entertaining us. He had us on the edge of that carpet square. And I watched this guy teach this day. And I remember 45 minutes is the amount of time he spent with us, and then he left. And I remember thinking to myself, I want to be like that guy. I want to be like Ranger Bill, the way he looked, the way he was teaching everything. And the animals he was using, all these animals had injuries, and they had stories, and they were ambassadors of the messages that he was sharing. Well, I went home that day and I told my parents about it. And I guess I kind of became a Ranger Bill groupie <laughs> because I went out and I started following this guy around. And he probably wondered, what is this little kid, <laughs> this seven or eight year old kid doing in the back of the room watching me everywhere I go? He'd go to the library, we'd go up there and see him. All these things, that picture there with, with little Nicky there, Ranger Nick with the uniform holding the Eastern King Snake. You know, I, I finally got up the courage to go up and talk to Ranger Bill, even after doing the Junior Ranger program with Ranger Bill. And I'm about eight years old at the time. And I ended up saying, is there anything that I can do to be around you more? <laughs> to shadow you, to help you? And I tell you what he said. He said, well, you sure can. And I ended up for about the next eight years cleaning a lot of cages out, all right? <laughs> And the owls and hawks are not the cleanest animals in the world, but I got a chance to be around this guy and watch the way he was teaching. And I'd go out with him on the stages in different places and watch him teach. And after a little while, maybe I was 11 or 12, he'd say, Nick, why don't you hold this turtle and stand up and talk about it a little bit? Or Nick, why don't you hold this eastern screech owl and tell the audience about it a little bit? I did that stuff, and I turned 16. And Ranger Bill says to me, I've been doing this eight years, going out and talking, and Ranger Bill says, that, Nick, this is all you've ever known, is watching me teach and wanting to teach with animals. He said, why don't we offer you a job? So I was the youngest guy working for the state of Maryland at the Department of Natural Resources, this little 16-year-old kid with my Ranger uniform and everything. And I would start going out there and using animals to teach with. Now, you had to be 18 to drive a state vehicle, so I had to drive my old Chevy Blazer. I'd put the seats down in the back. I'd put those carriers, the birds in there, and we'd go out and I'd talk. Now, I couldn't teach a bunch of high school kids. I was younger than they were. You weren't going to listen to me. <laughs> but I could go out and I could teach younger kids, and I'd visit camps and things and use animals in teaching. And I remember one day, it was in November sometime, I was at an event and I was holding an owl on my glove over here and I remember a, a news guy came up to me and he had a camera there and he put it in my face and he said, I'm standing here with Ranger Nick. 
And when he said that, I felt like I had really made it, you know? <laughs> like I had, man, I, yeah. My whole life, this is all I'd ever, my great grandmother used to say, you, you really called me your little preacher boy. And if I didn't do this ranger thing, I'd probably become a preacher. And people say, well, maybe you ought to think about doing that. But I didn't. And I, that guy called me that, and it was a profound moment. Well, I continued teaching with those animals for a number of years, and that led me down a path to college and graduate school and at the University of Georgia now for 10 years, teaching students how to do what Ranger Bill did 31 years ago. Still talking about it. And he was there for 45 minutes. Profound impact. Ranger Bill wasn't just presenting information. He was teaching it. And there's a difference. I want you to think for a second about a great teacher in your life. What would you put in that blank? Great teachers what? Think about it. I'll give you seven and a half seconds. No cheating. <laughs> Keep it to yourself. I'm going to come back to it in a couple minutes. I'm going to talk about that because I have my own thoughts about what great teachers do. The first thing that I think great teachers do is they celebrate mistakes. Errors. Things that happen that weren't planned that we have a choice as an educator, whether to capitalize on this or ignore it. Bob Ross, that television artist that paints things on TV, calls them happy accidents. It's a happy accident we made here. Okay. In the education world, we call these things teachable moments. Just makes it sound better. You make a mistake, you call it a teachable moment. And, and sometimes, from time to time, I don't know if y'all, I don't know if y'all see this or not. I, I know I'm... I'm not supposed to leave the rug, but something's going on over here. I hope they forgive me. I'm going to come over here. Talk about a teachable moment. Look at what's going on right here. This, this you're not, you're not going to, hey, what are you doing? What, you're not going to believe this. Not that this was planned or anything. <laughs> but all of a sudden, I look over there, and there's our state reptile, a gopher tortoise. We're talking about teachable moments. I had a choice to make right now. I could have either ignored that and continued on, or it could have become a distraction. And so I thought, let's capitalize on it. It's a teachable moment. So let's talk about, if you don't mind, indulge me for a second. Let me tell you a little bit about Shelly. Okay, this is Shelly. And look at the face. I mean, is that not the cutest? Shelly is 12 years old. She'll get almost 100 years old when she's at her maximum lifespan. She'll get about three times the size. Shelly is a gopher tortoise, a state reptile. A lot of people didn't know Georgia had a state reptile. That's pretty cool. She is a keystone species. Man, that sounds important, and it is. Just like an archway has a bunch of stones on it, and there's one stone at the top that holds all those other stones in place. If you take that keystone at the top away, all the other stones fall down. You take this little lady out of an ecosystem, keystone species. All these other animals are gonna be impacted because she digs these gigantic burrows in the ground that are the size of a school bus. And when fires come through in South Georgia and North Florida, all the animals that the fire would otherwise burn up, these animals go into her burrow. So she is essential in an ecosystem and she is a species of concern right now. These guys and gals aren't a whole lot out there anymore. So we got to do what we can to help them. So I'm so glad that she decided to make a little entrance. Every once in a while, she'll kind of wait. Oh, look, she's waving at you. Look, <laughs> look. You do that to kids, and the kids, everybody's waving back, you know. <laughs> That's just something else. All right, lady. Well, I tell you what. I'm going to get, this Becca's going to come out here, a turtle herder. Thank you, Becca. I'm going to give her back to you. Look at that. She's frisky now. Be careful. <laughs> yeah. Celebrate mistakes. Next time you make a mistake, call it a teachable moment. You'll feel a whole lot better about yourself and other people. It's a teachable moment. First thing great teachers do is they celebrate mistakes. Second thing I think they do is they appreciate differences. And I don't need to tell you that as a professor at UGA, I got a lot of different kinds of students in my classes. Everybody's different. And that's great. 
because they bring all these different perspectives and levels of experience into that classroom. But every one of them has something in common. And every one of them has something in common, just like most of us do in this room tonight. Everybody deals with public speaking anxiety. Sure, communication anxiety. And the students that are in this class come into this class with me that I call Teaching with Animals. And it is just what you can imagine, a class about teaching with animals. We learn about public speaking, but we integrate animals like that animal in that picture and help students overcome, overcome anxiety by handling an animal and teaching with it. And they'll tell me, they'll say, Ranger Nick, they'll say, when I'm holding this turtle or this snake or this alligator or this salamander, I don't feel like everybody's looking at me, they're looking at the animal. And I can relax, and I can be a better teacher and not just a presenter. Appreciating those differences is so important. One of the best things that I've ever done at the University of Georgia through that class is have those students come together take those animals and go about 10 miles down the road to extra special people. If you've never heard of extra special people or ESP as we call it, let me tell you. If you're in, that's right, if you're in need of a hug, go on down to ESP. You will feel so welcome and so appreciated. ESP is a place where literally hundreds of folks with disabilities, with, with learning issues, come together and they thrive. Special needs. They come together. I get my students with those animals, and some of those students are scared to death to stand up in front of an audience and give a presentation, and I get it. But they go to ESP, and they see those faces, just like my student Dakota there, and they take that snake out, or that turtle, or that salamander, they interact with those special needs kids, and they see this difference that they can make. Those participants look at my students like they're celebrities. They come to ESP, and they want to take pictures together. They know the animals, they know the animals by name. And my students visit there, and it builds their confidence, appreciating differences. Think about ESP, I tell you what, an incredible organization. So the second thing great teachers do is they appreciate differences. The third thing that great teachers do, I think, is relay feedback. Now, when I'm in class, I can look out at my students and I can see if somebody might be having a bad day or something's on their mind, and I can ask them about it. Hey, how's everything going there? Give them a pat on the back, an attaboy, an girl, fist bump, a high five. Everybody needs that positive feedback. We're so sometimes caught up on negative things that we don't take time to say, hey, you did a good job on that. Well, students of mine know that I enjoy grading. Grading my assignments tells me how I'm doing as a teacher. It's a really cool thing. And my students know that if you get a 90% or above on one of my assignments, I put a stamp on it. <laughs> and I have friends of mine that know that I teach college, and they say, Nick, they, I mean, they're not second graders. You're putting a stamp. I said, yeah, you get a 90% or above. I put a turtle stamp on there, and I write, <laughs> <laughs> I write, excellent job. I write it right on there. <laughs> Right? So, and I do, I do that every time. People, oh, come on. And I look at their faces when I get it back, and they're comparing, hey, I got a turtle on mine. <laughs> but the, the one time that I thought to myself, I don't know, Nick, you know, I, maybe I, I could just grade them and hand them back. It doesn't really matter. Well, I, I tell you, it does. I was teaching at a school to the south of here as a graduate student, and it's a, it's a big university. It starts with an F ends with Florida. I know, I know I'm not supposed to talk about it in Athens, Georgia, but I did go to school down there. There is credibility to this talk, all right? There really is. Let's get out of here, this guy. So I'm down there at that big university to the south of us, and I'm teaching a big class as a PhD student down there. It's a big class, a couple hundred students. And a lot of football players would take this class, and they would all sit down in the front down there. And one day I was handed back assignments in class, and I got done doing that. I went back to my little cubicle as a grad student, and I'm sitting there at my cubicle, and there's a knock on the door of the grad student office. And I'm kind of back in a corner of this big office in my cubicle, and I look around at the door, and there's one of the football players, a linebacker, and he's literally, he looked like a refrigerator. I mean, the guy, <laughs> he's taken up the whole door. And, it, and he's standing there, and he's looking at me, and he's got this assignment in his hand. 
and it looked like a post-it note in his hand. I mean, that's how big they got. <laughs> and he's standing there, and he says, Ranger Nick, can I talk? And I love they call me Ranger Nick. Ranger Nick, can I talk to you? <laughs> come on in, come on in. And he says, uh, I got a 91 on this, and I didn't get a stamp. <laughs> and I, he handed it to me, and he, this guy walked all the way across campus, you know. He came to my office. And I'm looking at it, and sure enough, I must have forgotten. So he hands it to me. And I can still see this like it was yesterday. Hands it to me. I reach into my desk, and I had an owl stamp in my desk I still use today. My students that are here know this owl stamp. It's a legitimate owl. It is a good owl. And I took this little owl out, and I inked it up, and I stamped it on his page, and I wrote, Owl Standing Work. And, and I handed it back to him. And you know, he walked out of there just as proud, as smiling, <laughs> like he was gonna go show his mom, Ranger Nick, I earned an owl stamp. And I said to my friends who get on me about Nick, you know, you give stamps, I said, let me tell you, if that big, tough football player could walk all the way across campus with that assignment to tell me he didn't get a stamp, wait to give me one, I'm gonna do that until I retire from teaching. It matters, it matters, it matters. Hey, it really does. Relaying feedback. You gotta, you gotta tell people how you feel, man, you're doing a good job, and that motivates them, and they can't wait to do the next assignment. What other stamp will we use? I've got a leaf, unbelievable work. <laughs> if you're having some problems, I've got a paw, positive improvement. These kind of things. Great teachers relay feedback. I think that great teachers also, and this can be tough, they evaluate themselves. And it's easy to take it personally. It's easy to look at that and say, oh, I don't know, I don't think they like me, you know, but you look at what students are telling you, and you gotta be willing to change what you're doing if something's not working. You gotta look around the room at those facial expressions. You gotta look around the room at that body language. Do I need to change what I'm doing? It's important. Evaluating yourselves in your environment is really key. And I am sure that you're wondering, what is this black table doing here <laughs> with this black bag on top? Which, by the way, I know that y'all can't see it, but my wife gets me these bags and it says Ranger Nick on the front of it. So <laughs> it's kind of nice, she's here tonight. So inside of this bag is something that does a really good job at evaluating its environment. And it uses multiple senses to do this, you know, multiple pieces of data. So I'm gonna reach into this bag and take this thing out, and I promise, I promise, it won't get away from me, okay? I promise. I'm gonna hold on to this thing, okay? It's inside of a bag because it's a really good way to transport it, plus nobody knows what's in here. <laughs> so when I'm at work over there at UGA and I've got a bag with me in a meeting and the bag starts moving, <laughs> people, most people, think, what the world's he got going on there? So I'm gonna reach in here, I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna introduce her to, she's called Snowy, is her name Snowy? She is a sweetheart, she's a sweetie. Come here, girl, let me show her to you. Oh, she's all warmed up, ready to go. She's all, she's all warmed up and ready to go. Now, I know what you're thinking, and I appreciate that nobody jumped up and ran away. You know, there's football players who are the first ones to run away when I take a snake out. <laughs> Tough guys. I know you're wondering, first thing, is it a poisonous snake? Well, first of all, there are no poisonous snakes. They're only venomous or non-venomous. This is a corn snake. This is totally hard. They don't pay me enough to mess around with venomous snakes, so it's a non-venomous <laughs> snake. It's non-venomous. Snowy is a corn snake. Snowy is a snow corn snake, is what she's called. Beautiful little lady. Now, this begs the question, though. How do you tell if a snake is venomous or not? You know, people ask me, what do you do? Well, if you look it up in some of these textbooks, here's what they tell you. First thing they say is, look at the shape of their head. A non-venomous snake's head is an oval shape, and a venomous snake's head is a triangular shape because of the venom glands back there. You gotta get kind of close to a snake to tell what shape head it has, <laughs> right? All right. Proceed with caution. The next way, I get to laughing about this, right? I get to laughing about this, yeah. The next way 
They say in the textbooks, the scientists, this is what they tell you, look at the shape of their eyes. <laughs> a non-venomous snake's pupils are round, and a venomous snake's pupils are vertical slits like a cat's eye. But can you imagine it? Bobby, get over here. Ranger Nick said, look at the shape of their eyes. Is this thing venomous or not? <laughs> By that time, the thing's bit you on the nose, you know? So I always say, when you see something as beautiful as this out in the wild, wave at it. Say, hey, thanks for what you're doing. Don't get a shovel. Don't jump up and down and scream. Appreciate what you're doing and walk away from it. They are doing incredible stuff out there to help us here in Georgia and all around the world deal with rodents and things. Snowy evaluates her environment, just like all snakes do. That tongue is flickering in and out, tasting the air, wondering if anybody down in the front row has a mouse or a rat in their pocket. I hope you don't. <laughs> She's about to eat again here soon. She's tasting the air. Her belly senses vibrations. So when she's on the ground, she can feel things. She's got this gland on the roof of her mouth that senses heat because they hunt a lot at night. So all of these senses she puts together to determine her surroundings. Where's food? What's safe? What's not? Same way a great teacher evaluates themselves with multiple points of data to make a decision about how we're doing. Snowy is a really, really cool lady. And she lives at home with us in an aquarium. It's not loose. But she lives at home. And those students at ESP know Snowy very well. When I go to ESP, they ask me about Snowy. Did you bring Snowy today? She's a great one. I, I'm going to ask Ms. Becca to come back out. Snake wrangler. She was a turtle herder. Now she's a snake wrangler. Can I give you Snowy? Thank you, lady, so much. We'll give her a round of applause for taking care of that. That's great. 